Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first NAID Digital Roundtable of 2023 with two fantastic speakers, uh, two of the most distinguished critics of Irish theatre at the moment, particularly of uh, Martin Madonna's work. I will introduce them uh, in a minute, but first of all, I would like to thank uh, Aline Fernandes, coordinator of NAID, who is joining me today uh, to conduct this conversation. And also Deputy Council Rachel Fitzpatrick, who will say a couple of opening words. Thank you so much, Rachel, for your presence and also for the incredible support of uh, the Consulate in Sao Paulo, DFA and the Emigrant Support Program to the Nuclear of Irish Studies in, at UFSCI. Thank you so much, Beatrice. Thank you for the kind introduction and good afternoon to everyone online today. Uh, my name is Rachel Fitzpatrick. I'm the Deputy Consul General here in Sao Paulo. And uh, as always, really grateful for the invitation to be a part of today's mm -hmm. event, uh, this first academic roundtable of the year. I've, I've had the pleasure of participating in a number of the roundtables over the past couple of years, and I find it really enriching to learn both from the excellent research of students at UFSCI, um, and of course, the scholarship of our visiting guests, uh, usually from Ireland, but really from the community all over the world. Uh, so today will be no exception and uh, really pleased to, to welcome uh, Professor Avon Jordan, Professor of Drama Studies at UCD, and Patrick Lanigan, uh, Professor of Drama and Theatre Studies at the University of Galway, neither of whom I've met before, but I, I like all of Patrick's tweets so frequently, I feel like we already know one another. Uh, yeah, so welcoming you today virtually, but hopefully we can have you with us in person or back with us in person at some point in the near future. We'd also like to acknowledge the fantastic work that UFSCI and NEI and its leadership professors uh, Beatrice and Alini have undertaken and continue to undertake to promote Irish literature and culture in Brazil and to create really lasting links between our two countries. So as Beatrice mentioned last year, the government of Ireland uh, provided institutional support uh, for the first time to the nucleus. And we are really genuinely delighted to be continuing that partnership this year. One uh, real highlight of 2022 was the first in-person Jornada of Irish Studies since COVID. And being there really highlighted uh, to Ambassador Hoy and to myself how rich the study environment at UFSCI is and the talent of the students and researchers there and the great potential really for increased links with, uh, between Ireland and Brazil. Uh, as colleagues and I all know, our government has recently launched its first strategy for Latin America and the Caribbean which is uh, committed to expanding the field of Irish studies across Latin America. Uh, NEI has been an excellent partner for us in taking this forward and will be as we continue to build on it over the strategy period. So today, of course, we're here to discuss Martin McDonough. McDonough is an award-winning playwright, screenwriter and filmmaker who since the 90s has achieved international acclaim and has brought the landscapes and traditions and cultures of uh, the West of Ireland in particular to theatres cinema's couches uh, of viewers around the world, perhaps more than, than any other artist. And he's also played a role in the meteoric rise of a number of beloved Irish actors, such as Colin Farrell and Brendan Gleeson, and is known for his absurdist uh, dark humor, which is uh, gaining popula popularity even here in Brazil. His most recent film, the Oscar, uh, nominated Oscar winning Banshees of Inisherin, was a huge commercial success here launched in something like 50 theatres, has since been in hundreds around the country and on streaming platforms reaching millions of viewers. Uh, I saw it in a movie theatre here and the audience were definitely laughing at the right moments. So I think the humour is definitely resonating. Uh, and as well as Banshees, this year Brazilian audiences will have the opportunity to enjoy a theatrical reading of Cripple of Inish Man, translated by our colleague and friend Domingos Nunez and produced by the wonderful theatre company Theologians, which is celebrating 20 years this year. So it's definitely timely to be here discussing McDonough's work and our experts can speak more eloquently, of course, to, to it and to scholarship around his theatre and cinema. So I'll hand over to our professors, but uh, finally, just once again, wanted to thank NEI, Beatrice and Lini for this event and for their ongoing work. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rachel. Yes, it's definitely time, uh, timely to discuss uh, Martin Madonna's work with uh, the global reach of his recent film, and also, there's been uh, productions of the Beauty Queen of Linane in Brazil, the Pillow Man, at the moment, 
uh, PhD uh, work being dedicated to his most recent uh, theater work and also to the Lonesome West and as I mentioned, the Cripple of uh, Inishman being translated by uh, the incredible Domingos Nunes and uh, being read, uh, staged and read this year in October by C. Ludings in a program of Irish Theatre and Disability uh, to celebrate C. Ludings 20 years. So uh, our, our friends, our guests today represent not only their own work uh, on Martin Madonna, but also long, long standing uh, connections with their universities, with the uh, University of Bali, with which we have an informal, have had an informal uh, collaboration for many years now, and UCD, with which we have a more formal uh, collaboration and academic exchange, for, have had it for a number of years uh, now. So welcome to Wolfski, even if digitally. Uh, Eamon Jordan is prof professor of drama, studies at the School of English, drama and film at University College Dublin. His book, The <coughs> Feast of Famine, the plays of Frank McInnes in 1997, so contemporary to Madame Madonna's first works, is the first full length study of McGinnis work. Then he had a number of publications um, on Irish theater and Irish uh, theater work, like for instance, the work of Conor, Conor McPherson and particularly the work of Martin Madonna. From Linane to LA, the theater and cinema of Martin Madonna was published by Irish Academic Press in, ooh, 2012, yeah. And uh, more recently, the publication of Paul Bra the Paul Brave Handbook of Contemporary Irish Theatre and Performance, the theatre and film of Conor McPherson, and finally, Justice in the Plays of Films of Martin Madonna was published in 2020 by Paul Brave. Uh, Patrick Lonergan is Professor of Drama and Theatre Studies at the University of Galway and a member of the Royal Irish Academy. He has edited and written 11 books on Irish theatre and theatre, or Irish drama and theatre, including Theatre and Globalization in 2008, The Theatre and Films of Martin Madonna in 2012, Theatre and Social Media in 2015, and the Irish drama and theatre since 1950. At present, he is writing a book on theatre and the Anthropocene, Irish theatre and the Anthropocene, and also complete research on Shakespearean performance histories in Ireland. So lots of connections with our interests of research in, in Florianopolis too, Ecocritices, translation production of Shakespeare. So welcome uh, again to Florianopolis, uh, Patrick. You've been here both uh, in person and, and digitally. Uh, so I guess we can begin with framing uh, McDonough's work from the beginning and then looking at his most recent production. So what could you say, uh, what's your view of McDonough's early reception, McDonough's work early reception? Uh, this is the question to both of you. Do you want to answer first, Patrick? Or? What do you want to do? I, yeah, sure. Uh, thanks. I will. So it's great to be here. Thanks very much. And um, as Beatrice was saying, I was in Florianapolis and I think it was 2017. And at that time, I said, I'd love to go back in the near future and I'd plan to do that. But then stupid COVID happened and um, ruined everybody's plans. Um, so it's just it's really nice to be here online with you all. And thanks very much for the invitation. Um, thinking about McDonough and the start of his career, um, we have to go back to Galway, actually, where I'm living, um, to the 1st of February in the year 1996. And at that time, the city was about to open a brand new theatre, and that theatre was called the Town Hall. And it was going to be opened with a new play, which was called The Beauty Queen of Lee Nan, by a young man called Martin McDonough. Nobody knew anything about him. Um, they knew Lee Nan was a, it's a town in the north of Galway, it takes about two hours to drive there from Galway City. Um, but it sounded very old fashioned, you know, the beauty queen of Linan. It sounded like the kind of plays that were being written in the 1950s. 
In one of the local newspapers, McDonough gave an interview, though, where he talked about how he was from England and how he had his parents had emigrated from the west of Ireland to London, how he had grown up there. And he talked about his his influences. He talked about Borges, a uh, South American writer. He he talked about a wide variety of things. And then he put on the beauty queen of Linan and suddenly there was a, an explosion of interest in his work. Initially, I think people in Ireland were, were very um, enthusiastic about it. They, they saw that the work was breaking taboos. It was saying things that hadn't been said up to that point. But as he became more successful internationally, um, there was an increasing amount of discomfort in Ireland about the idea that McDonough was making a lot of money by making Irish people look thick, stupid, Egypts, um, and so on. So he was quite controversial for the first few years, certainly up to the early 2000s, where he had people who really loved his work, but also people who really, really hated what he was doing for Irishness as well. Um, and so I think, you know, we can get into more detail about this, but that's a very quick overview of how it seemed to me at that time. Yeah, um, I agree with that. Um, I would just probably uh, say it slightly differently in terms of critical reception. Audiences seem to like it. Uh, awards followed very quickly, you know, in, in London and in New York. Uh, the critical reception then amongst the academic community was extremely ferocious. And uh, and part of it was he, he brought a lot of trouble on himself. Uh, he was a little bit insulting towards uh, those that came before him. And he didn't play the game, which you would expect by praising this person, that person, the other and he then also drew a bit of controversy when uh, he was involved uh, at a row at, at a, a theatre award in London with, with Sean Connery, which entered into the tabloid newspapers. But also he'd faced a lot of rejection before uh, Drew Theatre produced the work. So he'd sent plays to the BBC and they were rejected out of hand. He'd been working with different plays and theatre co communities in London, like the Bush Theatre, Finbar Theatre. And ultimately, it was, you know, uh, Gary Hines at Drew had given him that real opportunity. And really, I think a lot of the, 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 the debate was about, as Patrick said, about, you know, making a bit opportunistic around the discomfort or sorry about around the stupidity that was seen to be the characters. And people were hung up on the idea of inauthenticity. And I have to hold my hand up and say, when I saw the first production of Beauty Queen, um, my initial visceral response to it was somewhat like that, but I can explain that another, at another time. And in part, that was got to do with my own incorrect lens. So sometimes you can look at something, viewing something from the wrong point of view or perspective. And I felt I approached that with the wrong critical lens. And that gave rise to that type of, uh, you know, discomfort, rejection. Isn't it interesting, even? Uh that then you came to, to write two books yeah. <laughs> about, and added one collection of yeah. art about uh, Martin Madonna. Yeah, and, yeah because uh, I saw and, later productions that made sense, the kind of the farcical aspect made sense when I saw The Lonesome West that Gary Hines did, and I saw a revival of Beauty Queen, which was not grounded in the kind of naturalism that the earliest productions seemed to have been, or that was my perception of it, and then I got it. So in a sense, I didn't get it. Um, and I didn't get the inauthenticity of it, or Gary Hines says the artifice of it. And really, that's what makes it really interesting is the artificiality of it, not its realism. But in a sense, I was hooked to the idea of it being, you know, realistic or telling stories about Ireland that were no longer appropriate to how we were living. Yeah. And uh, in speaking of representations of Irishness, um, this question goes to you both. What are your views on his most recent film, The Banshees of Inishreen? It brings McDonough back to the Irish-themed work that he first found success with in the 1990s. Hmm. Is the film doing anything new, or is it, as some claim, recycling ideas that are now almost 30 years old? What do you think? Um, could probably talk about that for the, the, the whole era, potentially. <laughs> it's it's funny, when I saw Banshees, my reaction to it was very similar to the one Eamon just described for Beauty Queen, where I, I was I was watching it with, you know, excitement and enthusiasm, really looking forward to it. And as I got more and more into it, I found myself thinking, you know, he, he did this 30 years ago. This is this is the McDonough we've seen before. 
Um, and then I came away and I thought about it a bit more. And again, I, I started enjoying the fact that there was controversy for lots of people in Ireland saying the Americans will think we're thick Egypt who have donkeys in our kitchens and um, all that kind of stuff. And I, I think there are differences. Um, I do think that, first of all, unlike the Lean On trilogy, unlike the Aran Islands plays, he calls the setting of this film Inish Aran, which doesn't exist. There is no Inish Aran. Um, unless you're talking about the island of Ireland itself. Mm-hmm. So it's it's making very clear that this is not a real place, or, or if it is a real place, it's a metaphor for the entire island. I need to check this, and maybe Eamon would know, but I'm pretty sure that the word Ireland is never said in that film. And so the apparent civil war on the mainland that those of us in Ireland who know about our own civil war mm-hmm. immediately think is a historical thing. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. And there are little subtle clues in there throughout the film where, for example, a, a date is given on a calendar and, you know, supposing it's something like the 13th of April and it says in the calendar it's a Friday. But in that actual year, the 13th of April wasn't a Friday. So, you know, it's it's as if McDonough is setting up this parallel universe for us um, that is not like our real place, but similar to it in some ways. And when he does that, I think it gives it a really interesting frame to think about this as a sort of fable. Um, that is about friendship, that's about masculinity, that's about what artists do to themselves and to the people around them, which is a theme that we see in all of his work, including The Pillow Man and A Very, Very Dark Matter, um, two of his non-Irish plays. So uh, I think it's interesting from all those points of view. And then just quickly, the last thing to say about it is I think it shows his developing skill as a filmmaker. Um, The choices that he makes about the way he shoots the scenes are really interesting um, also really interesting is the score. He didn't compose the score, but he brought to the composer some uh, Bulgarian folk music saying, this is what I want for the movie score. And so the movie doesn't have that kind of, you know, the ill and pipes or the mm. fiddle that we would expect of traditional Irish music. It's mm. something more um, elemental and folk-like and strange. So I think all of those decisions that he makes and and all of the things that he's doing shows Yes, he, he may still be using the bag of tricks that he had in the 1990s, but the things that he's doing with it are definitely new and interesting. Hmm. Yeah, and, and my, my response was very interesting because I went, you know, really looking forward to it and I went to laugh and people sitting around me quickly silenced me. It was very interesting. I didn't feel comfortable laughing at the things I was I was laughing at. Uh, and then I watched it at, at home and I had a great time watching it uh, in my own space. And I, I felt it wasn't being watched. And I think a lot of people went with expectations that were not met uh, with that piece. And uh, to go back to Patrick's ideas of, the, you know, the details that were, you know, inconsistent with the real. I had, you saw people ringing up Joe Duffy, complaining about the fact or oh, people never drank, never drank beer outside a pub in Ireland in the 1920s, or this wouldn't be that. Or I remember seeing somebody complain about Downton Abbey saying, oh, they wouldn't have that font back in the, the era, that kind of thing. And I'm thinking, you know, that's not what I'm interested in, in terms of, of detail. And I'm interested in story. And what fascinated me was the idea of story and the fact that ultimately it's about friendship. Uh, and friendship falling apart and how it does. And sometimes there's no rationale for it. And really, you know, it, it, it's really about what we bring to that. And if for our own experiences of breakups or family arguments or all of that, we, in a sense, project on, that onto the, the, the capitulation of the relationship with, with, between those two characters. And I think that's Helen handled really, really brilliantly. But I have met people, um, including my osteopath, who would say, I watched it up to the up to the point of the fingers, and that was it. So that kind of visceral response that he creates for people, uh, it does get people away from it. Whereas someone like me, I really enjoy that because I expect it. Yeah, we know what to expect at this stage. It's, yeah. it's so interesting as well what you're saying about the kind of the uncomfortable laughter. Oh, mm-hmm. of mm. you know, I've had that experience, some, especially seeing the play in London. i seeing McDonough's work in England is very different from seeing it in Ireland because there's just a different kind of laughter. Um, and, you know, it's a different experience if you're an Irish person. Mm. So I, I was just wondering, what was the thing in the in the cinema that people were laughing at that was uh, not sitting well with you? Oh, sorry, it was the, 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 me laughing and wasn't sitting well with them. Is that what it was? The other way around. The other way around. 
Okay, I better stop now. You know, if you're the only person laughing in the cinema, <laughs> there's something. The finger is being chopped off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That makes you feel better, even. I was mm -hmm. definitely the only person laughing at the theater, the cinema in Sao Paulo. So, yeah. <laughs> but I, I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. And uh, as Patrick said, the uncomfortable laughter. So, yeah. some of our students are currently working with the idea of, of humor, of mm. black humor, disability. There is the self-mutilation, which provokes a disability. Mm. And somehow, although most people can't laugh at it, mm. for many people, it provokes uh, the uncomfortable laughter. Mm. Yeah. And that's, that's characteristic of McDonough. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'll, I'll shift the conversation a mm. little bit to uh, mm. your own work your own criticism mm. and uh, ideas that interest our students here currently doing research on Martin Madonna. So for instance, Patrick, in your book, The Theater and Films of Martin Madonna, you always have in the, in the collection, the Math and Drama Collection, Critical Companions, that, that uh, section, which is uh, for critical perspectives mm -hmm. and in which you include views of Mac Martin Madonna's work from the perspective of gender, post-colonialism, eco-criticism. So uh, what do you think would be the most contemporary take on McDonough's work uh, using your own uh, previous book? Uh, now that post-colonialism has in a way given way to I think more uh, perhaps ideas of uh, gender eco-criticism but that back then you mentioned uh, global, globalization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that series um, of Critical Companions from Messi, when, when we set it up, we, we thought it would be important to have perspectives from other people. So Eamon's book on Conor McPherson, which is also in that series, you know, includes, includes those perspectives too. And I think for McDonough, it seemed like a particularly important thing to do because one of the things I've really noticed about his work, and it, it's shown in what we've just been talking about, is that when you're in the theatre or the cinema, people respond to the work in very different ways. So are we to say that, you know, I'm right and the person beside me is wrong just because they're reacting differently? No, the reactions are valid, even though they're different from each other. So I think in the case of McDonough, the thing that makes him always interesting in the 1990s and now is that divisiveness of response. Um, and, you know, Eamon was talking about it in relation to the film. I think it's really interesting. Uh, how he can antagonize some people and how others will be excited mm. by that feeling of antagonism. I do think that, you know, some of those issues are still important. Uh, gender, for instance, I mean, we saw it in the Banshees of Inishirin where the character uh, of the sister was about the most sensible person in the entire film. And um, that was tied up in the fact that, you know, the presentation of her gender meant that people weren't taking her seriously, meant that opportunities were being denied to her. But very interestingly, a new production of The Pillow Man that is about to open in London, oh. has taken the uh, the lead character of Keturian, who in the original production and the script is intended to be a male writer. And that's being played by Lily Allen, woman. Um, so does that mean she's going to play Keturian as a man or does it mean Keturian has got to be a woman? Who knows? We'll see. But I think it's it's a really interesting example of how in his work that um, that kind of interpretation can become possible. And certainly colonialism, I think, is, is still in there to a very great extent. It's a huge theme in a very, very dark matter. And in a way, it allows those of us with an interest in the Irish stuff to go back and think about how the critique of British imperialism in the 19th century and that play can be applied in other contexts as well. Um, since we're talking about looking at his works uh, from different perspectives, now I have a question to you, Eamon. Mm. Uh, Eamon, your most recent book, Justice in the Plays and Films of Marty mm. McDonough, that was published in 2020, um, looked at McDonough's work from the perspective of justice. Of, mm. um, how did that come about? Um, it came about watching Hangman in London, uh, in fact. I was watching it and said, God, you know, actually all the plays <laughs> deal with justice in various ways. And it just it was one of those kind of moments where you you just see connections. Um, and in, in a way, I've always been fascinated by the idea of, of justice and how it's represented. And most of that comes from, you know, 
what I was exposed to as, as a kid, really, in terms of Hollywood, Hollywood films and, and, and popular culture. And in a way, McDonough is embedded in a great deal of that. Uh, but then when I started looking at it, you know, the things that fascinated me about McDonough were issues of kind of guilt and innocence and how sometimes you can be both guilty and innocent simultaneously or the ideas of miscarriages of justice or people taking justice into their own hands and that compulsion, whether it's revenge or as Steve Pinker calls it, kind of self-help justice. So, so many of the films and plays have characters that can't achieve justice and then go on the rampage and do things uh, in, in the name of justice. And whether that is uh, in Banshees, Vinish Sheeran or uh, Billboards and Mildred's actions and that in particular. And I had that idea before Billboards came out. And of course, Billboards really just confirmed the, the, my, my sense of his innate quest for justice uh, across almost all the plays. But you will find incompetent cops or corrupt cops in something like Scott and Connemara, incompetent investigations in Beauty Queen, um, you know, in The Cripple Imanish Man, the police aren't there to deal with any of the abuse that's going on in the backdrop. So the absence of justice, if you look at justice in the new film as well, you know, it's corrupt cop to an extreme, you know, violent, aggressive, abusive police figure. And that ties also in with, with the work of his brother, John Michael, and, and things like Calvary as well, which is also fascinating in its quest for justice. Um, yeah, so I hope that answers the question. Yeah, no, fascinating. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'd like to include some of the questions coming from the floor or sent previously by uh, some, some of the students, mm -hmm. which relate the film to contemporary work, to his theatre work, and to his more contemporary theatre work. So, uh, Michelle Alvarenga from uh, Ulspi, who is a PhD student at Ulspi, uh, studying McDonough's most recent theatre work. It's asking, since you're talking about the newest movie, do you see any similarities between the Benjis and the Lieutenant of Inishmore? Um, yeah, obviously, I mean, you, you think of, I mean, I haven't thought about that now, but um, when I was watching Ban Trees, you just felt there were all of those West of Ireland plays were being, being recycled, uh, the emphasis on violence, uh, the... the um, let me think about it. I mean, I, I haven't thought about that, but yes, I'm, I'm sure um, there is that sense of of uh, harm, the animal, the animal being harmed, and what it means. And in a sense, you know, uh, in in the, the recent film, the lens that somebody will go to to achieve uh, their justice in some respects, and it's a, a god awful idea of burning somebody's house down while they're inside, and ultimately, it's that somehow you grow through the action of violence, which is a very, very strange message in some respects, but in a sense, uh, 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 um, uh, Colin Farrell's character finds himself through violence and finds a better version of himself in some ways through uh, the anarch anarchic actions of, of the character. And of course, the violence in Inish Moore is, is very, very complex. It's farcical, first of all, and I think it's really important to understand violence in relation to genre. Uh, uh, Banshee isn't farcical in that particular way. And when Inish Moore is done well, you have to, in a sense, embrace it as a farce. And the violence of farce then is quite complex because it can be uh, visceral, but is also a kind of protection, protection uh, afforded to the violence in that you don't see it as real. Whereas I think in some of the violence in the, in the, in the recent film, you do feel it's it's grounded more in a kind of visceral aspect. That's a really messy answer. I'm sorry, uh, Michelle, no. to that. Yeah. No, no, I think uh, it's really interesting uh, to talk about uh, the potential farce mm, and uh, yeah. to put these, these two works together from this perspective. Mm. Anini, I think uh, your your student, your PhD student, Antonio, also had a question. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think this also kind of has to do with uh, what we're just discussing about justice. Um, this question actually comes comes from Antonia. She's my PhD student working with the Lonesome West. Mm -hmm. And her question is, in your opinion, this is actually to the both of you, 
How does McDonough satirise the downfall of the church's moral authority in Ireland in the Lonesome West, more specifically? Yeah, it was interesting when it first came out because originally it was performed as the third play in a trilogy. And so there was a, a running joke in the preceding two plays, Beauty Queen of Vinan and A Skull in Connemara, about Father Welsh, Walsh, Welsh, where people kept getting his name wrong. And so he was set up to be a ridiculous figure because we had laughed at him before he even arrived on stage. And so a strange thing happened then that when he did actually arrive on stage, he was a sympathetic figure. And thinking about it again, you know, it was 1997 when that play came out. Um, that was just about the time that shows like Father Ted were appearing on television and it was becoming possible to laugh at the figure of a Catholic priest in Ireland, which was not really something that would have happened often up to that point. Mm -hmm. So certainly there, there was laughter at Father Welsh, 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 but there was more important than that. There was also a high degree of sympathy. He became humanized in a way that we hadn't really seen in depictions of priests before. So it, it was, I think there was a degree of complexity there about the presentation of the priest in that it was making clear that the moral authority of the church was in crisis, but it was also saying, here's a man who's trying to live like a good Christian and look how difficult that is and why is it so hard? Um, so I thought, it, you know, it left people with a lot to think about. Yeah, thank you, Patrick. And also from Talita Ajibais, who is an MA student at Pulski. Talita is working with translation, so interested in dialects, accents, how to translate those, how to make that possible in performance. So it's actually uh, to Eamon. In your no. chapter, I'm no, sorry? Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. In your chapter, Performing Irishness with Illegitimacy in the Cripple of Inishman, mm -hmm. you go through the complex of textualization of Irishness given shape on stage mm -hmm. and mention the use of accents as traits that are used in performance. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that, that actors and directors might be influenced by the language used by the author and specifically choose to de depict one accent or dialect on stage? Do you have any thoughts on the choice of accent? And I think she she uh, is talking particularly about uh, Madonna's dialect use on stage. Yeah, I think it's a really difficult one. First of all, the language is not authentic. It's not an attempt to, to duplicate uh, a West of Ireland accent, I think. And uh, that's the first thing. The second thing is if you look at a play like uh, Stones in His Pockets, you know, there's an obsession with getting the accent right. And of course, there's an impossibility around that. And I've seen lots of productions of Martin McDonough where you have accents that are absolutely inconsistent. Um, I saw a production of uh, Cripple of Inish Man a couple of years ago where there was one of the actors from Derry Girls in it and she spoke with the accent she had in Derry Girls people speaking with different accents, Cork accents and Dublin accents. Phelan Drew was in it as well and had a, quite a pronounced Dublin accent. So I think accent isn't as important as sensibility. And I think the, the crucial thing with McDonough is to get the tone right and the sensibility right, that the actors are on the same page, so to speak, in terms of the genre specificity of what they're doing. And if you can get that right, that's far more important than getting hooked up on the idea of accent. And if you look at, of course, Cripple and Man specifically, there's the whole idea of the mockery of the accent in relation to a man of iron or Billy's attempt to do accents in Hollywood. And again, it's about higher, higher or foregrounding the idea of inauthenticity, the, the inaccuracy. So getting the sensibilities right is far more important, I think, than getting the accent right. And I think it's so difficult to do to get accents right. And even in Ireland with productions, uh, as I said, huge amounts of actions varying across across the board yeah yeah i would really agree with that i think that's that's really well said i am um, in 2014 i had the very good fortune to attend an international martin mcdonough theater festival which was on in of all places perm in russia and so i spent the best part of a week watching plays of martin mcdonough being performed almost entirely in languages that i don't speak Russian mainly, but also, you know, Lithuanian, Polish and a few others as well. And so it was really fascinating to watch the plays and to recognize them from the action. And as Eamon said, from the sensibility, from the mood, even though I didn't know what any of the words actually meant. 
And it, it brings home how I think in the case of McDonough, mm-hmm. Eamon already said it, it's the story, but it's also like the way the conflict happens on stage. It's you've got people in positions of extreme tension in very small spaces. Um, and that comes through very, very strongly when you when you watch the plays um, mm-hmm. as they are, you know, so it's yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. Mm-hmm. Could I ask one question, Beatrice? I'm prompted, prompted by the uh, Alini student's question about justice and sympathetic figures just while we were talking about it. Like, I, I really appreciate both of your analysis on his work set in the West and, and the criticism they've received as well. And I kind of agree that in spite this, of the circumstances of his upbringing, you know, these are stories he tells with some nuance and, and that his storytelling around Irishness have maybe evolved. But moving away from Ireland, I've read a lot of criticism around Three Billboards, the play, and then the subsequent film, which took all of the Oscars that there were in that year, I think. Um, criticism that, you know, a story about race in the American South is not one he has any authority to tell. And one reading of the story is that the, a particularly racist character is redeemed at the end, and that received a lot of backlash, I know. Uh, do you do either of you agree with those critics, or how do you feel about that? Do you want to go, Patrick? Uh, it's, it's such a complicated issue. I mean, I, I definitely agree with people who will say, that if we're going to talk about injustices related to racism in the United States, then first and foremost, we need to hear from people who have experienced that. But I also think that it should be possible for artists to do research and display empathy and understand what it's like to be someone who they're not. So I'd always be very reluctant to say that we should all stay in our lane and and never write about experiences that are different from us, because if we do that, we just become you know, we end up being in ourselves. Um, and I think the Pillar Man, the McDonough play, explores that really interestingly. It essentially says the only job of a storyteller is to tell a story. Mm-hmm. I do think sometimes McDonough will tell stories that he expects people will have a problem with him telling. And it's partly to do with his defense of that idea that a storyteller has a right to tell a story. Mm-hmm. So, you know, uh, there is a complex political situation there. It is important that we are you know, sensitive and aware and create space for all voices. But at the same time, I think long may he continue to tell whatever stories he feels like telling. Yeah, I would absolutely uh, chime with that. Uh, I've been thinking about that quite a lot and it applies to writers. It also applies to critics. You know, are we all going to stay in our own lane now and only write about this, that, the other? And there is the idea of of creative empathy. There is the idea of self-reflection. There is the idea of the imagination. And I think we're also... Uh, we also stray into the territory of censorship when we tell people what they can't do. Um, we can't determine people's responses to that, I suppose. I think that's important and people are allowed that kind of different responses uh, to something like billboards. But I think um, sometimes, you know, criticism is nuanced. Sometimes criticism is incorrect. And sometimes criticism reads things in the way that it wants to read them. So I would never have read uh, any redemption for... Uh, the Dixon character in Billboards the way that many critics did. I didn't really uh, as redemptive in any shape or form. And But that's that's my view. Uh, others are entitled to their own view. Uh, and the most important thing is that we can argue that out, argue that out in terms of diversity. Um, and to my mind, then, writers have to take risks and writers have to be curious about difference. And the, the judgment really is whether or not they, they're doing it well or not, rather than saying you can't and can't do that. And I think that we're into a very, very worrying territory. You know, if, if you know, for instance, likewise, so can I teach a play written by a woman? You know, um, yeah, you know, can I teach a play uh, written by a, a, um, an African Irish writer? And I think uh, in, in that in that situation, you know, students have asked me that in, in, in my workplace. And my way around that is I have uh, an African uh, person teaching an Irish play and I'm teaching a play written by an African writer as, as a response to that, because we have to enter dialogue. And if we believe in interculturalism, we believe in dialogue and we lead, and it's about getting things right and wrong. You know what I mean? Uh, and I don't have, you know, I don't have the experience of a neighbor, let alone somebody living in, in, in America. But I'm still curious about that life and that experience and what it says to me and what it says to me about their inequalities, I suppose, if anything. So it's a bit long winded, but anyway, sorry. Yeah. I suppose this brings uh, brings us to another question by a student who's mm-hmm. exactly interested in difference, in prejudice, in uh, 
disability base in the cripple of Finishman. And uh, his question is, how does the play, uh, it's from Kai Moreira, uh, an MA student. How's the, how does the play, The Cripple of Finishmen, reflect Ireland's relationships with difference? Having in mind its particularities of space and time, rural Ireland in early 20th century. And is it possible to relate characters' representation in the play with contemporary reality in those communities? Mm. Uh, so I think, Similarly to what we were saying earlier about the Banshees of Inishir, and it's it's not sociologically accurate, it's not history. So if you want to know what life was like on Inishman in 1936, that play won't tell you. Having said that, neither will the documentary Man of Aaron, which the play is based on as well. So there is a kind of long tradition of claiming authenticity without actually um, being able to support it. I, I think for me, and this goes to our thing about empathy, that one of the key things that the play does that's interesting is it, it takes a figure who in the society has been ostracized, namely the disabled um, eponymous character called Cripple Billy in the play, and says that he is the person the audience should take seriously. He's the person we should put at the center of the action, the center of our emotional engagement and the center of our response. And that's very powerful, not least for the fact that, you know, in the history of theatre and in filmmaking, so often the uh, disability, the disabled body was used to signal that somebody was a villain. So, you know, how do we know Richard III is a bad guy? It's because he's got a hunchback. Um, likewise, you know, you look at things like the Da Vinci Code, where how do you know that the, the bad guy is a bad guy? It's because of the way, you know, he's, he's physically disabled. Um, so, so many writers over the years have used physical disability as a metaphor for evilness and badness and otherness. And McDonough seems to be saying, take this example of otherness and what you'll find is that it's the thing you most identify with. So what does that do for your empathy? What does it do for your sense of self? What does it do to help you to be kind to other people? And I do think that's in the play. Yeah, I would agree with that. The centralization of, of, of Billy is hugely important to the piece and uh, uh, his disability exists, but Billy exists more than his disability, uh, I think, first of all. Uh, it opens up other questions about sizeism and ableism across the work more broadly, which, which I understand. And I've seen articles again in response to billboards. Uh, attacking uh, the presence of Pete, Peter Drinkledge in, in the piece, or if you look at uh, uh, in Bruges as well. But I think there's also a, always a counter to that. Um, so I think that's the, that's the first thing I would say. And secondly, um, uh, in terms of, of disability, it, going back to Patrick's point, something like uh, Sharon's Grave by John B. Keane, for instance, the signaling of disability with villainy, there is absolutely, uh, that is completely absent uh, in that piece, and intentionally so as well. So I think it's a very, very provocative piece. The other issue, of course, is then about the casting of actors, uh, able-bodied actors in those roles, and the implications of that. And I think that's a, that's a far wider debate. Uh, about that, and I don't know, um, you know, with Daniel Daniel Radcliffe cast uh, as Billy, for instance. Um, first of all, it was Rory Conroy, and in in in, in Dublin, uh, when Gary Hines did it a few times, there were different actors: Ty Murphy, uh, and uh, I can't remember the other Gary guy, Monaghan. Gary Monaghan, yeah, cast in the role. But I don't know if if uh, an actor with a disability has ever been cast to play Billy uh, internationally. That would be an interesting. Me, though. You know, what Gary Hines did for Druid when she cast Aaron Monaghan in that role, Aaron Monaghan had also played uh, a disabled character called Danny Mann in a Busico play and would later go on to play Richard III. So again, Gary Hines was placing these different representations of the disabled body into conversation with each other. And I think what that kind of does is, again, the idea that, you know, Billy should be played by a physically disabled actor is kind of missing the point that it's about the history of acting. It's about the history of able-bodied people putting on this persona in order to have a kind of metaphorical purpose that isn't anything to do with recreating real people. So, yeah. Um, perhaps one final question here. I don't know, Beatrice, are you, are we speaking at the same time? Or not? No, I'm sorry, please go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, so in, in speaking of, you know, representations of disabilities and everything, McDonough has a reputation for being provocative and controversial, you know, both in the theatre and in the cinema. 
Do you think there's a risk that his work will be produced less frequently during the coming years? I think as audiences and artists display a greater reluctance to engage with in your face approaches. What do you think, Damon? Um, I, I know he's very reluctant to change anything. I, I, I've read some newspaper accounts where people have asked to make this and that adjustment and he said no, and he, he declines to, to do that. Um, I don't know where, um, where, 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 where all these, these, uh, I suppose, uh, debates are going to go. But I think ultimately, you know, um, there is that possibility of, of cancel culture. I absolutely see that as a possibility. Um, but at the same time, uh, I, I, I hope not. Um, I think, you know, there's one thing to look at politicians to, you know, to, to point out their racism and their racist intent. You cannot do the same thing about a piece of writing in the same way. And I think you have to differentiate between the story, the narrative, the character and the writer's intent. And McDonough, for instance, would say he might have racist characters, but that doesn't make him uh, necessarily racist. And I think it's up to audiences to understand that a bit more if they're going to get very, very unnerved by, by certain types of, of representations. That would be uh, the, the quick answer to that, I suppose. Um, yeah, I think that's really true. And I think an additional factor in the case of McDonough is that because a lot of the plays were written in the 1990s, they have become dated because there, there are quite a lot of jokes in there that are from the 1990s. So I go to them and I hear a joke about Packy Bonner, who is the Irish um, goalkeeper in the World Cup in 1990 and 94. And I think that joke is hilarious, but for people under the age of 40, they don't get it. So there is a thing there about how the plays are actually no longer of our time. They're from a different time. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when you're translating them, you need to think that through. What do we do with those jokes? Do we update them? Do we leave them? Um, but I, I think likewise, you know, in the, in the 1990s, that in your face moment with McDonough and Sarah Kane, and other writers who were really breaking down the walls of what you could and couldn't do on stage. It was so important at that time, but it also worked because the walls came down. Mm -hmm. And so I do wonder about that. You know, do we need to see those 1990s plays by McDonough? Do we need to see Sarah Kane? Do we need to see Mark Ravenhill? I'd certainly be happy to see them, but maybe what we need is for McDonough to keep writing new plays and for, you know, for, for different artists to do different things because we have needs in our time now that are definitely different to what was the case 25 years ago. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Patrick. Uh, we have another question for a member in the audience, James Garanty. The contrast with In Bruges, with, in Bruges, with the same actors is the one where one will lay down his life for a friend in Benchies, the, friend, the friendship, the friendship is severed in pursuit of one man's ego, the two pieces of mirrors. Sorry, uh, it was just difficult to read uh, the message in the chat box. Mm. I think that's just a good observation. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, that's very interesting. Mm. And again, I, I think that, that decision about is really important there that you know, when McDonough put Brendan Gleeson and Colin Farrell in those roles, he was quoting himself visually. Um, but in addition to that, it's it's also worth pointing out, Druid, uh, we mentioned this a minute ago, they did The Crystal of Inish Man in 2012, mm -hmm. and about four, four or five members of the cast of that production are in The Banshees of Inish mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, including uh, including Kerry, um, whose surname I've momentarily forgotten, who played the lead female role. Kerry Lydon. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, well, yeah, anyway, but yeah, it'll come back to me uh, if not, but um, so I, I do think that, you know, he, he, he is holding them up as mirror images of each other, and I think they can certainly be watched in that context, definitely. Yeah, and, and again, you look at John Michaels and Anne Martin's actor pool, <laughs> you can start doing the same type of echo and, and mirroring as well across, across that, and I think uh, to me, one of the crucial things is that when he said he wrote Banshees, that initially you know, uh, Colin Farrell's character had, you know, was the, in a sense, the, the protagonist. Mm. And he adjusted that by the end where it was kind of 51-49. So he said he adjusted the seesaw that it wasn't really uh, from one point of view. 
And I think he does that quite brilliantly in Bruges as well, the relationship between the two of them, you know, a huge amount of empathy. And then, you know, the, the mirroring, the reversal of it in some ways is fascinating uh, with, with Banshees. Uh, and it's very, very clever casting. Um, and he could really do a fascinating comparison going through line by line or moment by moment or, or, or viewpoint to viewpoint uh, between those pieces, yeah. But again, the sister, and by the way, her name is Kerry Condon. Yeah. Um, you know, that is a crucial difference. And again, this goes back to the thing about gender is that in In Bruges, it is the two guys on a road trip in Belgium yeah. together. Um, whereas in this film, we have the character Siobhan in there who, who's mm. kind of standing back and commenting mm. all the time, but also escaping. You know, she's the one who leaves. Yeah. I do think that's a really important part of, of what she's doing. In that. Yeah, yeah. Can't hear you now. I think you're on mute, Rachel. Can't hear you. Please, Rachel. Sorry. No, I was just saying I think you were muted. Mm. Oh, I'm sorry. I was saying I would be just so lucky to have uh, these two in two of McDonough's uh, films uh, as audiences. Mm. I think it was. Ju it is just uh, an amazing experience mm. uh, in both films. Mm. But. Uh, since uh, all of us, except for for Rachel, but uh, in a way, she is too an Irish studies scholar. All of us here, we are Irish studies scholars. So, uh, do you think that these his most recent plays, such as The Hangman and The Very Very Dark Matter, are relevant to Irish theatre studies, or do they belong in a different uh, scholarly paradigm? Hmm. Well, I think we're both interested in the Murtry Eamon, so yeah, yeah, yeah. We we'll claim them anyway, regardless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, so, I mean, I, I one of the things I, I love about living in Ireland at the moment is that you know you can be an Irish writer and write about whatever you want, and it it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be potatoes and 1950s and the the national struggle and all the rest. It can it can be Charles Dickens and Hans Christian Andersen. And a strange woman in the attic. Um, but, you know, there, there are ways of reading the Irishness into it. I think in the case of Hangman, uh, like Eamon has talked about how it fits in with the theme of justice and the other works. I also think it's by far the play that is most influenced by Singh and the Playboy of the Western World. It basically restages the last scene of the Playboy of the Western World by stringing up the, the lead male character at the end. And then, you know, very, very dark matter. It is about colonialism. It is about writing. It has a huge amount to say about what Britain was doing in the 19th century. And I think that's certainly applicable to an Irish uh, context as well. But having said that, you know, for me, an Irish writer born in London can write about whatever they want. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I would agree with that. I think if you look at, um, you know, Irish novelists, they're writing about what they want, you know, Sebastian Barry can write about <laughs> any location possible so why do we say uh playwrights can't but 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 our poets can't or whatever our Irish musicians working in different across different genres and I think we're just hooked up on categorization in in, in some respects I think what is also very interesting is from what I can read that the kind of the British playwriting tradition doesn't really takes too many claims on Martin McDonough in the way that that you they often do about our, our Irish athletes or Irish uh, sports stars, which is is interesting in its own way. And again, you know, the linkages are there, of course, as Patrick said, the colonization aspect uh, of, you know, Danish colonization, Bel Belgian colonization, but the broader European practice of colonization and the violence associated with it. So really, in, in part of the, the reading of of, of a very, very dark matter is to see the, the horrors of colonization the and, and the legacies of that. And in many respects, there's a kind of oblivion around that. So if you look at the whole issue around uh, uh, slavery, uh, the knocking of statues, all of that stuff in Britain right now, the Windrush generation, all of that, uh, that, that's in a sense read out of that play. But in fact, it does speak to those things, I think very, very deliberately. Um, so yeah, uh, and the, with the films then set in America, you know, I think that's part of, of opening up the, the, the landscape. Uh, and there are those Irish affiliations in something like uh, billboards through um, the, the name Hayes, the use of the music uh, that, that is, is Irish, the name of the detective 
uh, also working on the UK. So I think there's a lot of the kind of uh, Irish links to that. But I think there's, I think, I think, you know, you would not say, oh, exclude those as a consequence because they're not actually set or located in Ireland. Uh, in Bruges was first written with with an idea of of London based hitmen, and then he, he adjusted that to to the, the characters being Irish, and in a sense, their Irishness does really speak to their sense of guilt uh, in a way that it mightn't have worked as easily with 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 two London based hitmen, for instance. So yeah, yeah, I believe Sorry, we have. I'm just, I'm just saying the the names uh, in Hangman like Hennessy, Mooney. Uh, Phyllis Keane, you know, when, when I grew up in the Midlands in Ireland, I had neighbours with all of those names, you know, within 50 metres of me, you know, uh, so very much uh, indirectly as, uh, associations with Ireland. Yeah, fascinating, interesting, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, this aspect of uh, a certain domesticity of the play, even if <laughs> it's not uh, entirely domestic. Entirely. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, we have time for maybe one more question, if there is a question from the floor. Uh, yeah, there is a question from Michelle Alvarenga about, Dr. Lonegan mentioned the new shift that women are experiencing in McDonough's most recent work. Could I ask the professors to share their opinions about the representation of women in these works, yeah, I think uh, in a way, yeah, you can address it. We have already addressed it, but uh, is that please. the more recent stuff or the work overall? Would you say is what's is what's of interest there? I don't know. She didn't mention, but she's working with more recent, mm -hmm. as far as I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, again, I, I think there's a thing there about how he is writing roles for pre people he's collaborated with. Uh, Kerry Condon is a very good example of that, who was in the Banshees of Inishir, and I think she, her first role with McDonough was in the Lieutenant of Inishmore. She's also been in Cripple of Inishman. And so I, what I find interesting about what he does with his women characters is when he's writing for people who he knows, actors who he knows, um, he he's really doing interesting things with those characters. Um, and I think, you know, Three Billboards is a great example of that really, really strong role for Frances McDormand there in the lead role. Um, so yeah, I don't know what you think, Eamon. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Francis Mc that that's that role is astonishing, Francis McDormand's role. Uh, first of all, uh the Kerry Condon thing is 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 I think really interesting because in a way, um uh Gar Bar Barry Kilgan and Kerry Condon stole the show stole the show. And I thought they actually outperformed uh, Gleason and Colin Farrell, to be honest, in in uh, Banshees. Um if you go back to the very first play. I mean, it's astonishing, really, that a you know twenty-something-year-old man is is writing about two women uh, on on the west coast, and people complain all the time. Well, you know, there's no mythologizing of mother-daughter relationships in, in in Irish writing more broadly. And here was an attempt, a very early attempt by him to do that. I'm not saying he did it, does it accurately, or or, but in fact, there's there's an, at least an engagement um, with that. And if you look at women characters in um, the Cripple of Minish Man, very, very complex uh, renditions of the two sisters in that. Uh, Helen's role is particularly interesting, whether it's her taking her own form of justice in relation to the people that are that are abused her and violate her, but also her sense of agency in the piece, I think, is, is, is especially complex. And it, it mirrors uh, Billy's uh, progress through the piece as well. So gender is is always, I think, very, very interesting. If you look at something like Lonesome West, it becomes, um, you know, on the one hand, Gerline is a kind of objectified in many ways by the male characters, but it's not left at that. In a sense, she fights back and uh, she puts a stamp on things. So I think McDonough's gendered characters, it's quite complex. If you look at even the more recent pieces like um, uh, and Very, Very Dark Matter, uh, fascinating study on, on, on gender and race. Um, so yeah, it's it's there from the start though, I suppose would be my suggestion, yeah. There's another way, if you had to choose between being a McDonough woman or a McDonough man, like you'd always choose a McDonough woman. So, you know, um, I think that says a lot as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But uh, uh, unfortunately, it's time to finish our conversation. 
I can't thank Patrick and Eamon enough for for this for this roundtable, and uh, I really enjoyed the more conversational tone of of this event uh, more than in previous events events that we've had, and uh, I also appreciate that you engaged with uh, our students' uh, interests. And this time we had time to bring in their interests, their questions, their doubts. And uh, would Aline and Rachel, would you like to say something before we close? I just wanted to thank you very much for this wonderful discussion. And uh, I really want to read a very, very dark matter. I haven't read it yet, it sounds fascinating so thank you thank you for all your insights thank you so much you're welcome absolutely as alimi beatrice says i've enjoyed this so very much i'm really excited to going back and re-watching all of his films now with your critical lenses and next time in ireland or, or anywhere that's showing his theater uh, hopefully that as well and thank you as always to alimi and beatrice for organizing this fantastic event thank you rachel uh at the moment my own mind is spinning so I'm going to close the, okay. the meeting with uh, ideas and thoughts. And uh, thank you so much again. You're Thanks. welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks to everybody for joining the call. Yeah. Thank, right. you. thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Take care. Bye.